Hi, my name is April Connolly, and I'm the Curriculum Specialist with Encompassing Education. My focus is on curriculum mapping and English language arts. I am so glad you are joining me today for this recorded session, and I would like to extend an apology to all of you who joined the live presentation uh, when we had a technical issue and could not get the audio to work. I hope um, that this recorded session gets you the information that you need. I'm going to go ahead and, and go to the next slide because I want you to be aware of my email address. Because we are unable to connect in a live format, uh, once you watch the recording, if you have any questions or you want additional information, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to me in an email. I'll be happy to correspond with you. I'll also give you some additional ways to reach out to me at the end of today's session. So uh, just a little background, I'd like to introduce myself if you don't know me. My name is April Connolly. I um, am joining you from Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I spent over 20 years in public education. In the last five years or so, I've dedicated my career to professional learning and instructional coaching um, with teachers all across uh, the state. Uh, just a few norms and housekeeping before we get started. I'm going to respect our time. This will be no longer than an hour. I'm going to ask that you take a learning stance. I think there are going to be some things in this session that you definitely have heard before, and I hope that you feel affirmed of those things, and also that maybe some of the things that maybe you've left kind of slip off of your plate or drift away from maybe might pull them back into focus. And also, I hope you learn some new things and take away one or two new ideas. Uh, please reduce as many distractions as possible and honor reflection time. There are going to be several times in the session where I pause the video and ask you to think or jot some ideas down. If you have not subscribed to our monthly newsletter, I would encourage you to use this QR code, pause the video, grab this QR code and sign up right away. It includes lots of free resources, tips and tools, our blogs, um, and that information is available to you every month to take a look at. And not just in the area of English language arts, it includes leadership, math, and other, other areas as well. As far as materials go, because this is the recorded session, you know that you have a recording of the session and a PDF of the slide deck. Uh, you also might want just a, a notebook or, or um, an open document on your computer to jot a few things down as we go. There are a couple of times where I ask you to reflect or think, and you might want something that you can just jot those thoughts down as we go through. My goal for today is that we spend some time and think about and understand why increasing reading and writing leads to increased thinking and learning. So we're not just focused on becoming better readers and writers in this session. We really are thinking about how reading and writing can be a vehicle for thinking and learning. And I wanna specifically hit actionable strategies that you can embed in reading and, reading and writing in really every lesson um, is, our, is our goal. I, wanna, I want to first think about this quote, and this quote comes from the Writing Revolution, and uh, there are several ideas that uh, I, that in this session that come from the writing revolution. Also, I would reference the writing rope. Um, if you have not looked at those two resources, the writing revolution or the writing rope, those are great places to start when you're thinking about content writing in particular. So I'm gonna pause here for just a second and let you have an opportunity to take a look at this quote and read it and think about what it means um, for you in your current position. So as you think about that, we're going to go back to that thought that teaching 
reading and writing and it, it's not about teaching reading all day long or teaching writing all day long it's about how when we read about content and write about content we really do grow our knowledge of that content i want to spend just a couple of minutes at the very beginning thinking about what it takes to be a proficient reader and what it takes to be a proficient writer, mainly because if you are a content area teacher or you may play a, di a different role in education, you likely haven't really thought about all of the skills that it, it, that it takes to teach someone to read early on or to be a proficient reader. So we're gonna start with the Scarborough Reading Rope. Um, for those of you who have an ELA background, this is something that you've probably seen multiple, multiple times. But the Scarborough Reading Rope represents the simple view of reading. And the simple view of reading really states that to be a skilled reader, so someone who reads and understands and comprehends what they're reading, then you really need two important skills. You have to have the ability to recognize words and you have to have that ability fully. And that is how you lift the words off the page. And that's really the instruction that happens early on for typical readers where we're developing phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. So we're thinking about all the sounds and words. We're developing decoding. So we have we understand that sounds are represented with symbols, so phonemes and graphemes, and we have sight recognition. So we eventually are able to read words with ease and develop fluency. The top portion of that rope, so the other big skill or big bucket that we need is language comprehension. And language comprehension involves all of those really powerful things that we need to understand the world around us background knowledge. We have to know some facts. We have to know concepts. Um, think about social studies. I have to know what a continent is. I have to know what a country is. Uh, we have to have vocabulary. So we have to know specific language that's used um, in, in typical English. Uh, but also we have to know the specific language that happens in content areas like science and social studies and history and art. We have to understand the structure of language. So we have to think of how sentences are composed, what the syntax looks like. We have to have verbal reasoning. We have to be able to make inferences about what we're reading and we have to have literacy knowledge. So we have to understand how books work, how genres work, and eventually disciplinary literacy. So how we read and write differently uh, from the point of view of a historian versus a mathematician or an artist or a scientist. And so that knowledge all develops over time. As students become more strategic and more automatic with those skills, the strands of the rope get tighter and tighter and that's what produces the skilled reader. If we're missing any of the parts of that rope or if one of the strands of the rope are frayed, we really aren't as proficient as a reader. So when we think about reading and writing in every subject, reading and writing in every subject builds that top portion of the rope, right? It builds background knowledge, it builds vocabulary, it helps us understand that we write a lab report differently than we wrote, write about an historical event. And that helps just create more learning and more knowledge. And it also, at the same time, creates a skilled reader and also a skilled writer. So I want you to take just maybe 30 seconds, pause the video, and think of an elevator pitch, right? You don't have a long time on an elevator, just about 30 seconds. And if you had to summarize or sum up the Scarborough Reading Rope. How would you explain that to someone, maybe a parent or another teacher or an older student? Uh, just kind of pull the thoughts that we talked about the Scarborough Reading Rope together and give a nice little summary of that. All right, so how'd you do? Did you Were you able to speak to the Reading Rope? 
Well, just like the reading rope, we have the writing rope, which comes from Keys to Literacy. Um, so if you aren't familiar with the writing rope, it kind of plays off of the Scarborough reading rope and thinks about all of the components that it takes to be a writer. And of course, as we become more skilled in those components, the rope tightens. So when we think about writing, there are different components that are comparative to write to the reading rope. Um, and so, you know, reading and writing are interconnected. We, we can't necessarily separate them, yet there are some differences in the skills. So when we're thinking about writing, we have to be a critical thinker. We have to understand how to generate ideas, gather information. We have to understand grammar and syntax like punctuation. We have to understand how to put that idea in and thought into a sentence, a full sentence. We know that we write differently than we speak. Uh, we know that writing is in a more formal language than just speaking. You have to understand text structure. And I did pull out the different types of writing as well off to the side. We know that we write differently if we're writing an opinion piece, a narrative piece, or an informative piece. And those types of writing happen more frequently in different subject matters. That also uh, lends itself, text structure lends itself to how we organize larger amounts of information, how we paragraph, how we uh, have topics, topic sentences, um, headings, those types of things to help our writing make more sense. We know that there's also craft, which is word choice, um, making sentences uh, more elaborate, where we're using maybe literary devices in this section, but we're creating writing that's interesting and grabs the reader's attention. And then last and um, uh, still very important is transcription. Uh, to be a proficient writer, you have to have proficient spelling, you have to have proficient handwriting and keyboarding um, skill so that you can actually get those thoughts down on paper. So all of those things are important for writing. So just like we did for the Scarborough Reading Rope, I want to I want you to pause the video for just again 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and see can you summarize um, the points of the writing rope and talk about them if you were explaining those to a parent or an older student uh, or a co-teacher. How would you summarize that information? All right, how'd you do? So that's just big picture ideas about reading and writing and all of the things that it takes to be a good reader and good writer. And when you are putting those skills to use with different content, then you are learning that content, which is what we want to talk about today. How do we get that reading and writing in every um, subject? So I want you to think about if you were to reflect about your typical day, your typical class structure, your typical routines, this might be if you um, if you are a principal or you're an instructional coach, think about typical classes that you visit or instruction that you visit and think about do you see students routinely reading and routinely writing? And really think about are the students doing the reading and are the students doing the writing? So I'm going to give you a second to just Think about that. You might even want to jot a few notes down. How often do you have students read? How often do you have them write? And you can pause the video so that you can have as much time as you need for that. Um, once you have that typical structure and routine down, I want you to think about 
what is an obstacle or what is getting in the way of reading and writing happening? And I'd like you to, to just jot those down. And think about that. Is there any obs are there any obstacles that seem to really be making it difficult for you to embed reading or embed writing? And I'm going to ask that you pause the video to jot those thoughts down. So hopefully you were able to get a few thoughts down on paper or in your head of what kind of is getting in the way of that. When I uh, am working in schools or working with teachers and we think about reading and writing, some of the things that I hear, and these might be on your list as well, is that uh, particularly in those middle grades, I hear um, the students just won't do it. I assign reading, students don't read. Um, I assign writing and it takes forever. Um, or students take a long time to do it. Um, if I'm asking students to do the hard work of reading and writing, then sometimes behaviors happen. Um, another thing that I often talk about with teachers is that I have a wide range of skills. And so I have stu some students in my class that I can't just assign reading to because they, they get frustrated. Um, sometimes it has to do with how much time something takes and that something takes too much time or materials there aren't enough materials so whatever your obstacles might be i do think it's important that you identify them because we have to figure out ways to overcome those obstacles so let's get into now some ways to address those obstacles how can we deal with some of the things that make it hard to increase reading and writing. And let's begin with something that may seem really obvious. However, if I were an instructional leader, if I were a, an instructional coach or a principal or a curriculum director, and I was trying to think about what's the one thing that I can do um, to increase reading and writing for students, it would be to encourage, look for, um, talk with teachers about putting reading and writing every day in their daily plans. So plan for ways to include reading and writing in all lessons, all subjects, and give the message to students that this isn't this is non-negotiable. You're always going to have something to read in my class. You're always going to have something to write. Um, think about in a middle school settings. Um, if a student read and wrote something in all six, seven, eight subjects, depending on how your schedule works, every day, at the end of the day, how much um, reading and writing would, would they have done? And I think we also want to really focus here that we're not talking about big reading assignments where students read multiple chapters or huge writing assignments where they're writing essays or research projects. We're talking about little nuggets of reading and writing. I honestly think that for the most part, a lot of content area teachers and English language arts teachers have some larger writing projects in their in their scope and sequence across the year. They have an essay maybe at the end of a quarter or they have a research project that they do in, you know, quarter three that's that's larger. And those aren't the kinds of things that we're looking for today. We're really looking at ways to put, you know, two or three hundred words that someone reads uh, about the content that they're reading and writes two or three sentences. We're looking for what are some little ways that we can put reading and writing every day in lessons in all subjects. And I'm going to stress this again. I know I said it and touched on it a little bit earlier, but this isn't because we want science and social studies and music teachers teaching reading and writing. 
It's because when you read and write about the content, so go back to those robes, you're increasing your background knowledge, you're increasing your vocabulary, and you're increasing how sentences, understanding how sentences work and how they're organized in your content areas. And that forces you to learn the content, right? And so we want that connection between reading and writing on a regular basis. The second thing that I would really look for are specific ways to find the gist or summarize chunks of text. And this could be text that students listen to, read, or even information that they're watching. Maybe um, a video or a short section of your lesson. But the reason why summarizing or getting the gist is so important is because it forces the learner to process the information, put it in their own language, and say that or write it. And that, that um, makes the learner really think about what are the main points what is the biggest thing that I can take away from this chunk of learning? And so you have to be engaged with the content to make that happen. And you can find the gist or summarize small chunks of learning or large chunks of learning. They, but doing that periodically with smaller chunks of learning really will help students grasp that concept and grasp, grasp the content that they're looking for. Now we're gonna talk about some strategies for finding the gist or summarizing. And I wanna stress here that it's not the strategy that provides the rigor. It's not the strategy that makes something difficult, it's the content. And so some of these strategies will work in elementary school, but they'll also work in high school. And that's because we change the content. So this first example, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, is an example of that. So I can do somebody wanted but so then by thinking about a chunk of um, text, literary text, or maybe a piece of history where we're talking about a biography of someone, or we're thinking about a an individual in history and, and how they operated um, or what they did, and we name that person what they wanted, but, so what was the conflict? So what did they do? And then what happened? And you can easily create a sentence or two that gives a really good gist or summary of a chunk of learning or a chunk of text. That can be done, and I have done it with very young, young students, second, third grade, um, can easily read a picture book and take a character and do somebody wanted but so then. But I can also do that same strategy with really difficult text. Let's take um, a literary piece like To Kill a Mockingbird, something that we would see common in high schools. I can do somebody wanted but so then with a character like Scout I can also do it to, to understand perspective. So I could do it from Scout's perspective, Atticus, which is the father, Jem, which is the brother, or any other character that's in To Kill a Mockingbird. Now I'm getting into perspective and I can start comparing how one character might be thinking or operating or making choices different than another. The same thing happens with uh, with history. We can do somebody wanted but so then with an historical event and take it from different perspectives, from different people. And that can help us start to understand and analyze that text at a different level. So again, that's an example of how a pretty easy strategy becomes pretty complex when we add complex content with it and that when we look at it in different ways. 
Another example of finding the gist or summary summarizing is just helping students create a summary sentence. So we think about who or what. So we name what it is that we're, we're learning about, the who or the what, did or will do, what, what's the action. So who or what, what's the action, what's, what are they doing or want to do, when are they doing it, where are they doing it, why and how. And when we think about answering those questions and then combining that to make a sentence, we can start to get a summary or gist of what we're reading or learning. Getting the summary or gist is more than just regurgitating information. It really does help us self-monitor our learning. Because if I stop after a chunk of reading or a chunk of learning and I can't summarize or I can't give a summary sentence, then that's telling me that I need to go back and rethink that content. This is one of my favorites, summarizing what you learned in 10 words or less. And so I've, I do this sometimes in professional learning with teachers. Uh, you can do it with younger students. You take a chunk of learning and at the end, they have to narrow it down into 10 words or less. And Sometimes less is better because you really do have to move out the extraneous, the details, and you have to get the big idea that happened from this chunk of learning. And so summarizing something in 10 words or less is a quick and easy way um, to engage kids. Again, that could be in writing and it could be oral. Um, it just depends on what you're doing and, and how you're working. And the last thing I want to talk about with finding gist or summarizing is thinking about text structures. Because when we're thinking about text structures, we answer questions differently. And so if students begin to recognize that this text is set up with a problem and solution, if I'm giving a summary or a gist, I just need to state the problem and how it was solved. If I am looking at text that is cause and effect, I need to talk about what happened and what happened as a result of that. What was the cause and what was the effect? Compare and contrast works the same way. If I notice that material is written in compare and contrast, I need to just, to summarize, I need to say how the topics are the same and different. And so our summaries and our gists can the structure of those can develop based on the text structure. So understanding text structure is an important piece sometimes of helping kids summarize or get the gist. Again, this, this activity is helping us process. The learner is having to process the content. We aren't writing summary sentences with random passages or random articles. We're really thinking about what is it that I want this student to learn about, and I'm going to have them do some summarizing work with it. This is also a time where you might see graphic organizers because graphic organizers can help you lead to or understand or, or pull out that important information for summarizing, especially if you have students who are uh, you're trying to do this with and you're not getting anywhere. Sometimes that graphic organizer can help. So that's number two. Let's move to number three, which is quick writes. And quick writes involve short, informal writing tasks, which take a small amount of in or out of class time. They're very, very short and they're very, very informal. These aren't pieces of writing that we're grading. They're quick writes. They are designed to help us remember organize and manage all the information that's coming at us every every day right and students are aren't different they are going to multiple classes they have multiple teachers they also have all of their pressures from social like friends and after school activities so they are processing a lot of information and so doing the quick writes really does help um you remember and organize and manage that information. Quick writes should be very, very frequent. Um, 
you want to consider how much a student would write in a day and and think about that if a student would write one quick write in every lesson they do across the day think of how how much they would have wrote by the end of the day by the end of the week by the end of the month and so we're just talking a couple a phrase a couple phrases a sentence a sentence or two or maybe even a list um, they can happen during warm-ups, exit tickets, notes are a form of quick writes, short summaries, um, sentence combining is a quick write. We're just dealing with a couple of sentences. We're going to talk about sentence combining in a minute. Any kind of short little communication, such as a really quick email or text or Google note or um, comment on something. This is also where we include things like annotating text. Sometimes this could be done on a Google form. So there's lots of different ways um, to embed quick writes into your instruction. Here are a few examples. This is just an admin and an exit ticket. So you're just again writing a short little bit about something that you learned maybe the previous day or as you're exiting the class. Here's an example of annotation. So here we have reading and writing in the same lesson where students are reading and analyzing text and they're jotting down notes and examples um, on the text off to the side. And we're using that to really help us process and analyze that text that would be included. Here's an example of a stop and jot lot. And I included that because sometimes we have you know, we have quick rides and it can become overwhelming as teachers. How do I look at all those? Do I need to look at all of those? Um, you know, I have five classes of 25 or 30 students a day. That's a lot of, you know, quick rides. And so a stop and jot lot is just on a board or a large uh, piece of paper in your room where you have it boxed off and numbered. And when students have time or given the assignment of jotting something, they add it to their square on the board. So maybe you're doing a small group, students are doing some independent work, and you've asked them to jot a note at a certain point and put it on the lot. Then at the end of class, you can come up and look across all the notes that are on the, on the jot lot. And not only can you read it as the teacher, but students can read each other's responses and see uh, what other people in their class are also thinking about. It's just a way to manage those quick writes and also helps with um, when you're trying to embed it into some independent work time. Another example of a quick write is just giving students some kind of a prompt where they write about something quickly. And this, of course, would be connected to content. In this example, I pulled a random, a random topic. But for what we're talking about today, this would be connected to what you're wanting students to learn about. And we're going to talk about a couple of ways to raise the rigor of the quick write. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is actually do a quick write on this question. In your opinion, what are some ways that cell phones have influenced education? So I'm going to ask that you just pause the video and you write two sentences, a sentence, a good, a long sentence, a couple of sentences about how you think cell phones have influenced education. So pause the video, start it back up as soon as you have your quick write done. So hopefully that quick write, again, it's a quick write. It should have only taken, you know, two, maybe two minutes, maybe three. And you have a couple of sentences down about your opinion about cell phones. Now, if I want to raise the bar on quick writes, one way that I can do that is by adding in a criteria. And in this example, the criteria I've added is that you will use at least two of the words that are in the box. And so you can see there are some vocabulary words. There's also a transition word like although. 
And so you, when you have your response, it need, that needs to be included. And that can be on the initial prompt, or you can ask, like I did, ask you to write your two or three sentences and then modify or evaluate your response to see if it has those words and add them or change them if you do not. And so again, then, then we're asking you to uh, modify, evaluate what you have. The other thing that you can do to raise the rigor on quick writes is ask that question and where students respond. So in your opinion, in this example, in your opinion, what are some ways that cell phones have influenced education? Get their responses and then ask them to share out, you know, possibly at their tables, but share with, you know, maybe four, four other students, a small group, and then modify their response based on what they learned from the other students in the group. So again, we're asking them to evaluate their response, which raises the rigor of that quick, quick write. The other thing that, the one last thing I'm gonna mention here is that you can also ask students to compose their quick write. And then as a group, put all of their responses together to make the best quick write and share those out. And that kind of activity can happen fairly quickly. Um, it does take longer when you add those layers on. So, you know, there may be one day where you just, you don't have the requirements. You just say, here's the quick write. You have two minutes, dismiss class. You may have another day where you have like maybe five minutes and you can add this extra layer in with the word requirement or some of the evaluative um, ways to respond. So quick writes are invaluable. And really, that's what we're trying to go for when we look for really quick ways to write in classes. The next example is giving kids lots of opportunities to read passages of text that are connected to the content that you want them to learn. And this doesn't have to be large sections. It could be a small section of a textbook. It could be an article. It could be um, even maybe some text that you have generated um, on, an, on AI about a topic where you want students to review or learn the content that's in that section, that really quick section of text. This has an additional layer though, because we definitely want kids reading short passages. Um, if you have issues in your school where there are students that you have a lot of students who aren't reading on grade level, these short passages of text that are connected to content learning could also improve fluency if you do that in a partner format or some uh, some way where they're reading aloud. This example though has a writing component also built into it. So in this paragraph, there are two fragments and I believe this came from the writing revolution. Embedded in this paragraph, there are two fragments. And so you ask students to read the short, short passage, find the two fragments, and then correct those sentences. And correcting those sentences and turning them into complete sentence requires content knowledge. So they're having to use the knowledge um, that you're wanting them to learn to fix the fragments. So in this example, I have the two fragments underlined and then corrected at the bottom. And of course, those answers are going to vary a little bit, but we're really looking for students then to write a full sentence. It's embedded with the content that you want them to learn. They're also applying some writing skills, sentence structure, and getting some reading time in. And so all of that really does increase your comprehension your reading ability, your writing ability, and what you've learned about the content. This is a great way to review for a quiz, a great way to review um, for a test where you, you where you have some specific content that you want kids to remember. Um, getting it in those short paragraphs uh, really can 
uh, do the work for you. This isn't this isn't something that's very that's extremely difficult to plan. You just have to find those little pieces of text, locate them, and get them on a you know on a screen, on a Google form, on a paper, uh, whatever works whatever works for you. And I'm going to talk about one of my favorites now, sentence combining. And sentence combining is where we take kernels of information and put it together to create a longer, more elaborate sentence. And so this example is from science. This is a pretty complex sentence combining activity. Again, this is one of those examples where you could do sentence combining in third, fourth, fifth grade, all the way up through high school, because what makes the rigor is the difficulty of the content, not the act of combining sentences, even though that's hard too. The more sentences you have to combine, the harder that is. So if you want to, I'd like you to give this a try, pause the screen and try to create a sentence from these four and tell me what, think about what happens when you go to do that. So pause the recording here, give this a try. So what you come up with? Here's the possible solution. Here's one possible solution. Of course, there's more than one when you're combining sentences. Um, more importantly, what happened when you tried to combine sentences? How many of you had to reread these starter sentences multiple times? I know I did. Um, how many of you had to really think about what is it that these four sentences are saying? How can I get them in order, right? And then you ended up with a pretty long, elaborate sentence. So having students practice this with content helps them learn and understand the content, remember the content, because they've had to process that information. They've probably read it multiple times and wrote it, which helps it stick. And then the other thing you want to think about is that also helps them in their writing in general, because if you can combine sentences that are given to you, you can also combine and create more elaborate sentences in your own writing. And you can even ask students to do that um, in their own writing. Um, if you're, an, especially if you're an English language arts teacher, you can say, take a look at your piece of writing. Is there, are there places where you can combine sentences to make one more elaborate um, sentence? And that takes a lot of the skills on the rope, like word choice, um, you know, your ability to inferences and syntactic information. So, so that is a really strong uh, practice as well. So when you think back to your beginning, when you jotted down some of your obstacles or some of the things like maybe you didn't have materials or maybe um, you weren't sure how to do to embed more uh, writing and reading. Hopefully these possible strategies uh, fit that need and you see some ways that you can put reading and writing um, in every subject. This is the part of the, com of the presentation where I would open it up for questions and I, I do want to again apologize that the live session did not happen today. Um, I, I again regret um, and I'm not sure what happened, uh, but we are we just have to deal with things as they come. So if you have questions or if you want more information, again, do not hesitate to reach out. My email is at the beginning of the presentation in the end, as well as some additional contact information. So please, please reach out to me. I um, especially want to make sure that you feel like you can do that because of the the technical difficulty that we had today for the live session. I'd like for you to just pause right now and think about what is your one key takeaway from today's learning session? And I am going to ask that you write that down. I think there's some power in writing um, as we've talked about today. So write that down. What do you want to remember? What's your key takeaway? Maybe it's something that you want to try with students. 
jot that down, pause the video and jot that down. That's your quick write for today. And I'd like to mention in closing that Encompassing Education can partner with you um, through in-person professional learning sessions, virtual professional learning sessions, on-site instructional coaching, as well as um, I do want to mention that this is actually a full day session and it is scheduled on November 5th at Southern Indiana Educational Center. There's a link here if you'd like to log on and look at that option. I'm mentioning that for all of you who are maybe close to Jasper or in Southern Indiana, um, I'd love to see you at that full day session. We'll definitely cover the ideas that we talked about today, but it is a full day session. So we're gonna cover a lot more and uh, do a lot more similar things um, than just what we what we discussed today. You have already received a copy of this recording in PDF, so please save that and share it with others. This is the Encompassing Education team. We have specialists in multiple areas, um, and so we can help partner with you uh, regardless of what you, your needs are. If it's math, we have Bill Reed, who's an amazing math person. If it's leadership, we have Diane McKinley, the owner and CEO of Encompassing Education. We also have Tabitha Freeman, who is our director of partnerships and grants and can help uh, facilitate that for your school or district. Here is all of my contact information, email, phone number, you can call or text, of course. You can also reach us on social media. And last but not least, you um, can get a certificate for today's session for one professional growth point by scanning the QR code um, and answering just a couple of survey questions. It takes about a minute. And within 30 seconds, you will receive an email that um, contains your PGP certificate for this one hour session. I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to do this session with me. Um, and listen to the recording. And I hope that I hear from some of you. I'm going to be watching my email, uh, watching, uh, listening from my phone, and hopefully I can connect and talk with you soon.